This presentation is called, How is the Prisoner's Dilemma Related to Hamilton's Universe? So in this presentation, we're going to answer two questions. First, we're going to review what is the prisoner's dilemma. And secondly, how is the prisoner's dilemma related to Hamilton's universe? So what is the prisoner's dilemma? Well, we've gone over this before, and we stress that the prisoner's dilemma is not what it's often thought to be, which is a narrative about two prisoners who are being interrogated by the police who decide to cooperate and keep quiet. If we think about that, we have to ask the question, where's the dilemma? If they decide to cooperate and keep quiet, it's hard to know what the dilemma is in the prisoner's dilemma from the way that the story is often told. So instead, we've defined the prisoner's dilemma as a mathematical model in which rational self-interest blocks cooperation. And that's a dilemma. So when our rational self-interest are not what's best for us collectively, this is what's known as a social dilemma. And the prisoner's dilemma models a social dilemma. Another way to put that is that it is a model of a social dilemma. And we have a social dilemma whenever what is best for a group as a whole is not aligned with what is best for its individual members. So in a social dilemma, group interests do not equal or coincide with individual interest, and this is what the prisoner's dilemma is about. Now, when you look at the prisoner's dilemma as a mathematical model, at one level, it's just a set of payoff matrices. So two things define what's called the prisoner's dilemma. And the first is the payoff matrix that goes along with it. And you'll notice that if we look at this distribution of numbers up here, then obviously three is greater than two, which is greater than one and greater than zero. As we've discussed in earlier presentations, these numbers are not just randomly placed up there, but rather they represent the payoffs to the choices that are made by the players. So in the traditional prisoner's dilemma, each number has a name that identifies the payoff. So the number three up there stands for the temptation to cheat. And that's because if the row player cooperates and the column player defects, the column player in that case earns three points rather than just two. The cost of that is that the row player earns zero points. So the temptation for the column player is to cheat and choose three. So we can replace those uh, threes with Ts. Two stands for the reward for cooperating, and that's up here in this corner where both players cooperate. One is the punishment for defecting, and that's down in this corner. So we have defection coming across the row and down the column, and the ones mark uh, the corner of the matrix where they intersect. And lastly, zero is called the sucker's payout, and that's what you receive when you cooperate and the other player defects on you. So if we go up here, we can replace the threes with a T, we can replace the twos with an R. We can replace the ones with a P and the zeros with an S. And so it's not the exact numbers that are in there, but rather it's the relationship between them. And we can say that we have a prisoner's dilemma game whenever the payoffs are structured so that the payoff to T, that's a temptation to cheat, is greater than R, which is the reward for cooperation, which in turn is greater than P, which is the punishment for defecting, which in turn is greater than S, which is the sucker's payoff, 
that occurs when we cooperate and the other player defects. And in order to have a prisoner's dilemma, these inequalities have to hold in this order. So we can change the values here, and in fact, uh, this is what game theorists do. But in order for it to remain a prisoner's dilemma, the inequalities have to remain in that order. So in this case, it's marked out very clearly. Here's the sucker's payoff at zero, the punishment for defecting at one, the reward for cooperating at two, and the temptation to cheat at three. But we could change that three to a six. And in that case, the numbers differ, but the inequalities stay in the proper order. So if we turn that 3 to a 6, well then 6 is greater than 2, which is greater than 1, which is greater than 0. We're still playing a prisoner's dilemma, only now we've increased the temptation to cheat. On the other hand, if we reached up and we turned the value of, of uh, R to 8, so the reward for cooperating was increased to 8, we'd no longer be playing a prisoner's dilemma. And that's because quite clearly 8 is greater than 6. And because 8 is greater than 6, it changes the order of the payoffs and it creates a different game. We're no longer playing the prisoner's dilemma. So what's the second thing that defines the prisoner's dilemma? The first thing is the payoff matrix. Uh, there's a second thing, and that's the preferences of the players. So we could modify the prisoner's dilemma and say that the players are other regarding altruist. And this means that rather than maximizing their own welfare, they're going to do whatever benefits the other player in the game more than themselves. And we'll come back to the question of whether or not that's possible later. The point for now to make is that the story about the prisoners is not essential to this. So we've discussed the prisoner's dilemma both as a card game and as the classic story of the prisoner's dilemma. But to illustrate this point once more, we're going to look at what's called a donation game that was developed by a mathematician named Carl Sigmund. And this game is discussed in Sigmund's book, The Calculus of Selfishness. So how does the donation game work? Well, each player starts with $5. And then the rule is that if I donate my $5, the other player will receive $10. And that holds reciprocally. So if they donate $5, I'll receive $10. That means if we both donate our $5, we'll come out with twice as much money. And if we give nothing, we simply keep our $5 and end up with half as much money as we could have had. So what's going to happen here? You have the same options that I do. What should we do? So let's look at this and work through the possibilities. So each player has a choice to donate or keep their $5. And the cells then mark the intersection of these choices. One is both to donate. Another is for both to keep their five dollars and then we have the alternatives where one donates and the other keeps. So what happens when this occurs? Well if both players donate five dollars they each receive ten dollars and jointly that's twenty dollars. They have twice as much money as they started with and we might think that that's the obvious thing for them to do. But as it turns out it's not. Another possibility would be the case where blue uh, donates $5, and as a result, the orange player receives $10, but orange reneges on donating, and she keeps her $5. And if we add 5 to 10, orange ends up with $15. Because orange did not donate, blue ends up with nothing. So that's a sucker's payoff for blue and nothing, and the temptation to cheat for orange is 15. That could happen in reverse, so it could happen that orange would make the donation so that blue receives $10, and then blue defects and does not donate, 
And as a result, Orange receives nothing. Orange has given away $5 but hasn't received $10 because Blue refused to donate her $5. And now Blue has the reward of the temptation to cheat. And Orange has a sucker's payoff. The last choice is where both of them simply keep their $5 and neither makes a donation, in which case collectively they end up right where they started. So let's think about this from the perspective of the orange player. What should orange do? And although we're looking at the column player, we want to look at this across the rows because what we're interested in is what's the best response of orange to a play where blue chooses to donate $5. And if we look across here, we see that if orange also donates, orange receives $10. But on the other hand, if orange defects and keeps that $5, orange is up with 15. And because 15 is greater than 10, orange should in fact choose to keep that $5 and not donate it. On the other hand, what's the best response of orange when blue chooses keep? Well, if orange donates when blue chooses keep, orange gets nothing. Whereas if orange keeps for $5, orange gets five, keeps $5, and that's better than nothing. So again, orange should choose keep. And in fact, whatever blue does, orange will come out best if orange keeps for five dollars and does not donate. So you can probably see where this is going if we look at it from the perspective of blue and put these payoffs up here. Now we need to look down the columns because blue is asking what's my best response when orange donates five dollars? Well the best response is to keep that five dollars and earn fifteen dollars which is more than ten and what about when orange keeps the $5? Well, the best response of blue is to also keep $5 and prevent ending up with nothing. So $5 is more than nothing, and orange comes out ahead. So the choice again for blue should be to keep the $5. And we have the curious outcome where both of them end up right where they started and neither of them double their money. So no matter what blue does, orange should choose keep. And at the same time, no matter what orange does, blue should choose keep. But the dilemma in this is that in doing what's in their individual self-interest, they come out the worst possible outcome collectively that they could. So we can see this by looking at the joint outcomes. If they had both donated, then jointly they'd end up with $20. But because they chose to keep, they ended up right where they started with $10. Even if one had donated and the other had chosen keep, it would all be in the pocket of one player. But in those cases, they'd have $15. So the dilemma in this is that although we might expect the players to choose cooperation, which in this case is donation, in fact, if we look at it and work through their rational decision making, they're going to end up with the worst possible outcome. And that's the dilemma in the prisoner's dilemma. So of course, this assumes that the players are self-interested and we could say, well, what if the players are focused on the welfare of others more than themselves? Then in that case, whatever blue does, orange should choose donate. And at the same time, no matter what orange does, blue should choose donate. And if that were true, they would end up again and again in the highest payout corner of cooperation. So the question is, is it really believable that an organism would evolve that would be entirely altruistic and that means that it would be more concerned with the welfare than by welfare, we mean reproductive fitness. So it would entirely work to benefit the reproductive fitness of other organisms and constantly sacrifice its own. So we'll come back to that question. But right now, let's go back and recall Hamilton's universe and think about how it might be reflected in the prisoner's dilemma. So remember that Hamilton's universe has four corners, a cooperative corner, a selfish corner, 
an altruistic corner and a spiteful corner. And there seems to be some connection between this and the prisoner's dilemma. So on the one hand, in Sigmund's donation game, we have the corner where both donate, and in doing that, both of them benefit. So we can call that the equivalent of the cooperative corner of Hamilton's universe. On the other hand, we have the corner where both choose keep, and as a result, they're both harmed. And there we appear very much to have the equivalent of the spiteful corner of Hamilton's universe. And then the remaining corners are either selfish or altruistic, depending upon the perspective of the player. So from the perspective of the column player, altruism is when Orange chooses to donate, and in return, uh, the role player chooses keep. In that case, Orange has behaved altruistically in sacrificing its reproductive fitness to benefit the role player. Exploitation applies to the case where the role player donates and Orange chooses keep. In that case, Orange has harmed the role player in order to benefit its own reproductive interests. So this is the selfish corner. So from a column player's perspective, we have cooperation, selfishness, altruism, and spite. But if we look at it from the perspective of the role player, we just reverse the position of selfishness and altruism. So selfishness now is when the role player chooses to keep after the column player has donated and benefits at the expense of the column player and altruism is where the role player donates and the column player responds with keep and in doing that behaves selfishly and exploits that donation. So altruism from one player's perspective is exploitation from the other player's perspective and that's an interesting insight. And this raises one last question that we're going to explore in the next presentation and that is, does this mean that what Trivers called reciprocal altruism is actually reciprocal exploitation, or is it the case that these are simply equivalent to one another, that reciprocal altruism from one perspective is reciprocal exploitation from the other? Thank you for listening.